We can hear it. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I think if you click settings, can you click settings right there on that window and then see if you have an option to change your microphone to be just the input? Your yeah. audio. I will do that. I think we're on. Right. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, got it. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for attending API Days and attending our session about MuleSoft. Um, I think we have about eight people watching live. Uh, so if you want to just introduce yourself in the chat um, and tell us if you've ever used MuleSoft before or what your level of experience is, that would be awesome. Um, we're going to be doing a couple quick demos today. Uh, first off, we're going to be showing off and giving you a little walkthrough of AnyPoint platform. And then I'm going to be showing off um, how to actually build an API um, and deploy it using AnyPoint Studio. And then lastly, I'll show off um, basically how to apply some API policies to the API that we created in AnyPoint Studio and deployed to AnyPoint Platform. Um, so it'll be pretty awesome. Um, we're really excited to give this talk to you and I'll let Kevin introduce himself right now and you can go ahead and talk about what you're gonna be showing off. Yeah, thanks Jordan. Yeah, so, so Kevin Balaji Kevin here. And uh, excited to be here at API Days with all you folks. Uh, I'm excited to show you all a new offering that we have. It's called AnyPoint Data Graph. Uh, we're very excited about it. It's a great way to consume many APIs in your organization pretty well, uh, but without needing to know all the expert, have all the expertise of writing a GraphQL schema and maintaining it and all that stuff. Uh, so we're going to show you how that works. It's a great way to consume information from all your APIs much faster. Uh, we'll show you some details on that in a quick demo. Very excited. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So yeah, I got everything set up on my computer here. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen and then we can uh, get started. And once again, if you're here, you're watching live, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. We'll be reading the chat messages. And if you have any questions as we're going on uh, with the demo, um, feel free to ask and we'll try to answer them in real time. So cool. Ooh. I think I'm sharing the wrong screen here. Let's see. All right, cool folks. Okay, so just a little background on me. Um, I work, work as a developer advocate. And so basically my job is to improve the developer experience and to create tutorials and content to teach you how to use MuleSoft. Um, so if you're new to MuleSoft and you've never used it before, what I recommend you do is I recommend you go to MuleSoft.com and you can go to the developers tab right here and you can go to tutorials. And we have a ton of out of the box tutorials for you to get started. Um, the one that I recommend you get started with, which we're gonna be covering in this talk is Hello Mule. And the first step to basically get started is you have to start a free trial AnyPoint platform account. Once you create this free trial account for 30 days, you then are going to be prompted to download AnyPoint Studio, which is an IDE uh, that you can run on your local machine. So whether you're on PC, Mac, or Linux, um, we can recommend you download this and you can then build an API all within this embedded experience, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so once you've downloaded uh, AnyPoint Studio, then the next step is to create a project, which we're going to get into uh, now. But before we do that, I just want to give you a quick overview of AnyPoint platform and what you can do with it. So this is the main AnyPoint platform screen. Um, as you can see, there's a ton of different options of things that you can explore. Design Center is a great place to get started. So this is where you can basically build APIs live in the web browser. And there's an option for a visual editor to create your APIs. And there's an option for a code editor where if you want to um, manually code your API and OAS or RAML, you can do that here. Um, we then have a place called Exchange. And I'll go ahead and click on this. You can basically think of Exchange as an app store for all of your different APIs and integrations. And so you can see here, these are all the APIs that I've created in my own organization. But if you go to the Provided by MuleSoft tab, you can see that we have tons of out-of-the-box connectors so no matter what 
system you're integrating with. Let's say you need to integrate with Amazon S3, or you need to take data from Salesforce, and then um, let's say take that data from Salesforce and put it into an external database, right? This is where you can basically grab all of these connectors, drag and drop them into your scene to basically create complex integrations in really a matter of minutes. Um, and once you create your API and integration, when you deploy it to Cloud Hub, you can actually deploy it to Exchange. And then everyone in your business unit, so if you work in a large organization, you can basically then share these APIs and integrations with other developers or architects in your org, and then they can consume and use your APIs. So that way, even if you leave, um, your, your content is basically available for the entire company to continue to consume. So that's a little bit about Exchange. And then once again, we have AnyPoint Studio. That's where you can create your integrations. Um, once you actually publish your API, then we have uh, different features in Management Center, like API Manager, where you can manage your APIs and manage APIs, API policies. So let's say you want to apply um, DDoS protection, or you want to apply, um, let's say, rate limiting, right? Um, that's where you can apply these policies. So you can see that right here, I have a bunch of APIs that I've created. And if we click on the actual API, we're, we're, we can basically view analytics on how many requests are being sent. Um, we can grab our auto discovery ID. And on the left-hand side here is where our policies are located. And so what we can do is we can go and we can click apply new policy to one of our APIs, and we can apply a rate limiting policy to it just by simply going into any point platform, clicking a few buttons and then clicking configure policy. So once we wanna apply and configure a policy, we can simply put how many requests we want. Um, we can choose that we wanna only be able to send one request per, per minute to our API, and then we can click apply. And just like that, the policy has now been applied and we'll go live. Um, so that way we can limit the amount of requests coming in uh, to our API at one time. So this is just a good example of what API manager can do. And then with runtime manager, this is where you can actually manage your mule apps. So when you create your API, there's actually a mule application that's running behind, uh, behind the scenes, right? Which is powering that API. So this is where you can basically go in and you can manage and you can see, okay, how many meal messages are being sent? What's the CPU usage of this API, right? And this is where you can allocate, let's say, more resources. So let's say you need to scale up um, your app to be able to support more uh, real-time like interactions with it. Um, or let's say you want to configure and see your logs, right? Maybe there's an error in your application and you need to debug it. Or we want to configure like the object store, right? This is where you basically go um, to just manage your app in real time. We also have some other features like Visualizer, AnyPoint MQ, which is like a message queue service. Um, we have a secrets manager and also access management where you can basically go and you can manage your various um, tokens for your sandbox environments, for your production environments um, and everything like that. So now that you have a brief overview of what AnyPoint platform is, we're going to start off by actually going to Design Center and we're going to start designing an API from scratch. So I'm going to go and I'm going to click uh, create new, and I'm going to go to new API spec. And let's just name this uh, Hello Mule test. And let's actually use the visual editor um, instead of using the RAML editor uh, to create our API. So when we click cre create API spec, um, we're then going to be taken into, into Design Center, right? Where once again, this is a visual sort of editor experience, right? And you can see here on the right hand side, this is where our RAML code is located. And we can do things like name the, name our API, right, with a title. We can uh, assign a version number. Um, we can add different protocols. So is our API going to support HTTP, HTTPS? We can also define the media type of what our API, like how you're going to be able to interface with it, right? Um, we can add descriptions. We can add security, right? Um, and now we've created our base layer for our API, but now we actually want to create a data type. And what a data type allows you to do is it allows you to basically um, create an example of what sort of data is going to be accepted and sent to our actual API. Um, so let's just name our data type Hello Mule. Let's define it as an object. And we can add some properties, right? Uh, we can add, let's say, first name. And we can define that as a string, maybe last name, right? So now if you make a post request to this API, um, it, 
you should basically send the post request using these credentials or else it could fail. Um, that's kind of how it works. If we go to our resources, um, this is where we can actually create our API endpoint. So if we name this API endpoint, hello mule, um, what we can do is we can select a, a post request and we can add a summary. So we can say once again, hello mule, we can ask what it's secured by. And then under responses, we can add responses like a 200 okay response. And so if a 200 okay response happens, so we hit a post request and it gets a successful response, we can then return um, in the body of that response, the object that we just created under our data type, which would return first name and last name, right? So we're basically defining in our API specification what sort of data is going to be returned um, when we make a request to our API, right? So this is really important because let's say you have a database, right? And you make a request to your API endpoint and you wanna only return that information in a certain format from let's say your database, this is where you're going to create the specification to basically create the rules and parameters around how you're going to interact with your API. Um, but then when you actually bring this API into AnyPoint Studio, that's where you write data weave code and you basically um, write the, the logic on how this integration is going to work, right? So now that we've created a very simple example of an API, what we can actually do is we can click publish and we can publish this asset to exchange. Um, when we do this, uh, it basically will publish the asset and uh, we can then access it from AnyPoint Studio. Um, so I'll click publish from ex to exchange here and let's wait for this to finish. Um, and then we can actually view the asset in exchange. And once again, anyone in your business organization can then access this um, and use it in their own Mule app. So let's actually go and view this in Exchange. Um, and you can see that we can add things like a description. We can add photos, um, videos, right? Like if you want to describe how to interface with this API. And we can even view um, the different endpoints. And you can see here on the right-hand side, we have a mocking service. And this allows you to actually test your API live in the browser. So if we click this button right here, um, we'll enable the mocking service. And we can click Send to basically get an example response back, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so we know the API is working. It's now deployed uh, to Exchange. So if we go into AnyPoint Studio, this again is the IDE that allows you to create APIs and integrations um, on your computer, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go to File, New Meal Project. And we just created that API and, uh, and we published it to Exchange. So what we can do is we can actually click the plus button and we can choose from exchange. And then we can go and we can search for that API uh, and then add that to our project, right? So hello mule test, we just created this um, and we can click the add button. For this example though, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create a simple HTTP uh, API. So let's go ahead and cancel this and let's just create hello mule three and let's click finish. Um, so now we have a blank, a blank uh, project and I wanna explain a little bit about how the AnyPoint IDE works. So on the left-hand side, we have the Package Explorer. This is where you can view all of your different uh, APIs and projects and integrations, right? And on the right-hand side, this is the Mule Palette. So like I said earlier, we have the marketplace called Exchange where you can download all of those different APIs and integrations, those like pre-built connectors, right? Like for Salesforce or for MongoDB or for Twilio, right? So what we can do is if we wanna add one of those modules to our scene, we can click the Add Modules button or we can click search in exchange, right? And when this window pops up, we can search for things, let's say like Salesforce, and we can see that there's a Salesforce connector. There's a bunch of different ones that we can choose from, or let's say we wanna send a text message with Twilio, right? Um, we can search for that and we can add that connector to our scene. But for the case of this project, we wanna create an API endpoint, right? So what we do is we go to this Mule palette and we click HTTP and we click HTTP listener and then we drag and drop this into our scene. Uh, when we do this, when we drag and drop it, it's going to create a flow. And this message flow, you can think of this as it, it basically executes in the order of operations, right? So it starts with an HTTP request. So it listens for someone to send a post request to this endpoint. And we're gonna name this endpoint uh, hello mule. And then under the connector configuration, we have to configure this, this endpoint. Um, we're basically gonna say, okay, if we send a, a post request on 
0.0.0 uh, port 8081. And then we click test connection. Um, we can basically test to see is this port available and are we going to be able to send an HTTP request to our API. So let's click OK. And then you can see that we should no longer have a little red uh, box under our HTTP listener because now our listener is valid. So now what we're going to do is we're going to search for a set payload component. This will allow us to set what the payload is going to be. So when you create uh, or when you send a post request to this endpoint, it'll then return you with the payload that we're going to define here. So let's just define the payload as a string and let's just call it hello meal, right? So let's go ahead and run this project. And you can see in the console, what's happening right now is Anypoint Studio is now building using, uh, using Maven. And it's basically building the app in real time. And then it's going to deploy it on port 8081. So that way we can send a post request to the API and we can try it out live in the browser. Um, so you can see that the, our application successfully deployed. So if we go over to Postman and then we basically send a post request to once again, port 8081 and with the endpoint hello mule that we define in the HTTP listener, um, we can then click send. And just, just like that, you can see that in the body of our response, we received hello mule uh, because that's what we set the payload as. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty simple to create an API, right? And we did this in a matter of just like less than a couple minutes. Um, so this is obviously a very simple example, right? But if we want to complicate this and we want to start adding and creating these more robust integrations, like I said, you know, we can add the Salesforce connector to the scene where let's say we can create a lead. So maybe when you hit this API with um, an API request, you send some data like you send first name, last name, email, right? And you want to upload that, let's say, as a new lead to Salesforce. It's really as simple as just um, basically configuring your username and password and security token in Salesforce. And then you just um, basically choose what type of uh, what type of request you want to send. So you would just put like a lead. So I want to upload a new lead to Salesforce and create a new lead. And then under payload, you would basically just format your JSON um, object in this box right here and you would basically just send the data that you want to send to salesforce right so when you're basically ready to publish this integration um all you have to do is you right click on your project you go to any point platform and then you click deploy to cloud hub and once you click deploy to cloud hub you'll see this window will pop up and it'll give you an option to uh basically name your application is something unique that no one else has. So you just have to make sure that this is a unique app name. And then in your properties, this is where you can add things like API auto discovery and other AnyPoint platform features, um, like basically putting your client ID and client secret in here. So that way AnyPoint platform can register um, that your app has successfully deployed. So if we click deploy application, it'll then deploy it to Cloud Hub. Um, but what I've actually done earlier is I've actually deployed this Hello Mule app uh, to Cloud Hub already. And as you can see before, is we actually applied um, API policies to our API. So once again, we're going to go to API Manager. Let's go and confirm that we created these API policies. So under he our Hello Mule API, um, we created this policy here uh, on rate limiting. So let's go back to Runtime Manager and let's grab that URL and let's try to make a post request to it to see if it works. So this is the URL that we're going to grab to try it out. We're going to go over to Postman. Uh, we're going to replace uh, the, our local host with our, uh, with our actual live URL um, that's being hosted. And let's click the send button. We're actually getting a 405 not allowed error. I believe this is because um, we're not allowed to send a request on this because we, we have the rate limiting policy. So already a request has been sent. So it's basically blocking the request and not allowing it to go through, right? Um, so that's basically how it works, right? Because we applied rate limiting, um, we then get a request basically saying it's not going to allow it to go through. Um, but as you can see, if we don't apply rate limiting, then it'll work. So I hope that was helpful. If anyone has questions in the chat, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, but if not, I think that kind of wraps up. Um, kind of the presentation and the live demo of how to get started and how to create your first API in AnyPoint Studio. So I hope that this was helpful and I will hand the mic over to Kevin who will explain to you basically once you create an API, 
then you can then expose your API using data graphs. So that way you can basically take multiple different APIs and then call all of them with a single GraphQL uh, query, which, which makes managing all of your API endpoints super easy with uh, any point data graph. So I'll, I'll, I'll give it off to you, Kevin, so that way you can uh, kick off the conversation. Perfect. Thank you, Jordan. I'm going to go and share my screen now. All right. Well, once again, thanks, Jordan, for taking us through that. I think that was a great explanation of how you can create APIs on any point platform, set policies, apply API management, one time management, so on and so forth. Uh, what we're going to do with data graph as jordan said is show you it's a newer offering we have and it's a great way to consume many apis uh, from one single uh, endpoint and so the problem specifically that we're trying to solve right is you know we've come to a place where we're creating apis more specifically we're creating rest apis uh, and that's been a great start we went from a world of custom code to where we we're reusing apis instead of starting from scratch and it's taken us so far but there's even more speed that we can get. We want to be able to reuse many APIs at once without having one individual request to each API and parsing through each response information together. If there's a way, we want to be able to consume all those APIs across with one single request so that we can really accelerate our delivery capacity. So how do we go ahead and do that? So conceptually, the APIs that we form, it might be obvious, but they have relationships with one another. So in this example that you see right here, a product API can be related to an invoice through a product ID. A shipment API might be related to an order through a shipment ID. So there are a lot of relationships that exist already amongst the many APIs that we have, and that we can conceptually stitch them together to form this graph. And this graph can unlock some new possibilities. So now with the graph, a developer can take the graph as in one endpoint and just ask it one question to, for pieces of information that he or she might want across all these APIs and they get it in one single request. And this concept is gonna cascade to each and every project that you have. You can continually reuse the graph. The other thing is that this graph is gonna run as a service. Uh, it's not gonna require any maintenance or patching. And that fundamentally is what we're trying to do with data graph. So that's any point data graph with data graph. Again, we're trying to serve data from many APIs in one request. And to do that, we'll, sh we'll give you the ability to unify all the APIs you have into one single GraphQL service. And you'll be able to do that without writing any additional code. So you don't have to write a GraphQL schema or anything to do that. Uh, we'll have a, an interface that you can just go in and explore the APIs you have within your exchange and then add them to this, to this uh, GraphQL endpoint. And then developers can use that GraphQL endpoint and build their own query and ask the, the single question that they want with a GraphQL request and then get it back. And with that, you're not gonna be able to be needing to write additional APIs just to request information from other APIs. You're not gonna need to parse through long responses one at a time. Uh, you're gonna consume information from APIs much faster and reach that next level of productivity and delivery speed. So I'm gonna shift now to a demo where we'll see this live. It's gonna be a use case driven demo and I have this all recorded for us, so I will go ahead and play it. For the purpose of this demo, meet Aka, a Northern Trail Outfitters, or NTO. Like the typical developer, he has so many projects on his plate. He's tasked with creating an application that gives customers a real-time view of products, orders, and shipment status. Now, NTO is a MuleSoft customer, and they've built up their network of APIs over time. Here are a few APIs that Akash will be using to create these experiences. This is a good start, but Akash knows there's a lot of manual work involved. Today, you have to write API requests to each API and parse through each response manually and rinse and repeat for every API that he uses. However, Akash knows that there are relationships between these APIs. Different fields relate all these APIs together, as you can see. We also have duplicate data types. Product information is returned from two different systems and hence two different APIs. Akash wants to take advantage of all these relationships and find a faster way to consume these APIs for his projects. To help with that, Akash goes to Lenny, an enterprise architect of NTO. Lenny manages and secures all these APIs. 
She is going to give Akash and other developers a faster way to consume these APIs with MuleSoft's new offering, AnyPoint Data Graph. In this demo, you'll see how Lenny will first reuse different REST APIs and convert them into GraphQL interfaces without writing any additional code. Next, we'll see how she can stitch together duplicate data types returned from different APIs to remove redundancies. Lenny will then link APIs together based on the fields that are identical between them. In this way, Lenny will create a unified schema of all NTO's APIs. Once Lenny is done, we'll go back to Akash and see how he can consume many APIs in this unified schema in a single request to more quickly build experiences. We'll start with the first step. Lenny is going to use AnyPoint Data Graph to add an API and its associated data types to a unified schema. In the back end, this will convert into a GraphQL interface without any additional code. Lenny starts an AnyPoint exchange. Here, we can see the different NTO system APIs. We have products from a database, customer data from Salesforce, orders from an OMS, and accounts in Salesforce. As we look at the orders API as an example, we see that it has a few data types in the specification, orders and products. It has a get resource to return orders for a given order ID. If we test it out, we see and it's quite long and gives a variety of details for each order. Next, we'll also see that these are managed instances in API Manager. They're all active and they're all running on an endpoint. So with these prerequisites in mind, we are ready to go to AnyPoint Data Graph, where Lenny will look to serve data across all these APIs to developers much faster. For this example, Lenny will add the orders API. It's found in Exchange, and she can pick the version and asset and add an active URL for her API. This all pre-populates for her based on the info in Exchange. She can add authentication based on the requirement of the API. In this case, we don't have any authentication for the API, so we proceed. Here's where the magic starts to happen. All the data types and fields of the API are automatically extracted. Lenny can see it all for herself. She can choose which fields are visible in the unified schema, and she can start to rename data types that she may have missed in the specification. And she can make these fields a bit more user-friendly for her consumers. Next, Lenny wants to enable developers to query individual orders at a time. Here, she's setting the methods and keys by which developers can make this query. Furthermore, she's enabled collaboration on this type, which means you create a more connected unified schema so that your clients have a more efficient query experience. And as we'll see later, enabling collaboration on other data types allows them to select this order data type to merge or link. Now, similarly, Lenny enables querying with a product data type. Once we're all done with the first step, the schema will start to update, and then we can see it in action. So let's run a query. To do so, we'll create a new client app. Let's give this app a name. Now we're taken to a visual query builder. Here, we can build a GraphQL query to consume different pieces of data from the unified schema. Now, the neat thing here is because it's in GraphQL, we can choose what fields are relevant to us. We no longer need to parse through long REST responses just to isolate what we need. So in this example, I can choose some product details, some order details. It doesn't matter. I pick what I want. And DataGraph has thus converted our REST APIs and their associated data types into GraphQL interfaces and Lenny didn't have to write a single line of code to do it. Now remember, we have multiple sources of product information coming from multiple systems. Lenny wants to merge these two data types together so that users can consume product info across both the LMS and the PIM systems in a single query. Let's see how she does that. To start, 
Lenny will add the PIM product system API to the unified schema. She's following the exact same steps as she did before. She picks her asset and her version, sets the authentication, previews the schema, and then proceeds. Now it looks like there's a conflict here and there should be. Product already exists in the schema from our previous APIs. Lenny is going to choose to merge the two API data types. To start, she has to enable collaboration so that this data type can interact with the other types that have collaboration enabled. If you remember, we did the same thing when configuring products from the orders API. Now it's time to do our merge. Lenny sees that the product ID is the same across these two types. She chooses to merge them with product ID as the primary key. Once this is done, this will consolidate product information from both APIs in one type within the unified schema. And there it is. Fields from both the OMS and PIM system APIs are included in the product type. You can see the fields here and the methods by which you can query them. To see this in action, we'll run another query. Now we can select product details from both the LMS and PIM systems. Let's go ahead and choose what we want and run our query and it works. We've now merged and consolidated data types. The last step is to link related APIs together with common fields. If we link them all together, we can find customers by accounts and orders in a single query. Let's see it in action. To start, let's see how we get customer information in the schema as it is. Right now, customer ID is within the orders data type. We want to find more details about the customer and a particular account. Those details are within the customer and accounts API respectively. We've already seen how to add an API to the schema. For demo purposes, we've added both accounts and customer in another environment. Now we want to link some APIs together. Here, this is the orders API. It has a customer ID which it shares with the customer API. With these two fields, we can create a link so that we can query both sets of information with one of the order query methods. We see here that the linkage has happened on the orders. Let's go back to the unified schema. And we can see here as well the link is completed for both the orders. And on the customer side, likewise, we've linked accounts with the same type of relationship. We've unified these APIs together. Now let's see the type of queries we can build. Now that we have one unified schema with accounts, customers, orders, and product details, we can build a single request to get the information we need across all these APIs. In just one query, I can see various types of information as I see fit. Now these queries can be long to remember. Datagraph will keep your most previously run queries in history, so you can continuously refer to them and rerun them if needed. Furthermore, you can identify response times across your GraphQL interfaces to ensure that you're meeting any performance SLAs. For troubleshooting, you can use the logs to trace through your requests. Now the data graph with the unified schema is all ready for Akash to consume. He's been building that app he just needs the information from the APIs and NTO's application network. That's all there in any point data graph. Akash has the query ready and he runs it. 
this is exactly what he needs. He needs to copy this query and the associated endpoint to use within his client application. Here he has a client ID and client secret that can be used to securely use his endpoint within his app. Let's go into the actual application code. This is the JavaScript application where Akash will use this query. Using this information, he set up his fields accordingly. This is great because usually Akash would write lines and lines of code to parse through so many API responses. Instead, he's done a quick copy paste and he has what he needs. Let's see an example application in action. We can see the query up live for customers on the front end. We can likewise see the output on the front end for order details. This application renders an order based on an ID. And it looks like it all works. That was just one example of the types of requests Akash could run. With his data graph in place, he can chose to show all products, stock, and suppliers for a warehouse stocking agent. Or orders for a specific customer with their account details on a storefront kiosk. All the information is in the schema and can be queried according to Akash's needs. So thank you all for watching that. Uh, one thing that I'll close with here, uh, Jordan went over how you can sign up for a free trial. Uh, it's the same process. Data Graph is available on that free trial account. So if you sign up for a new AnyPoint platform free trial account, you can go ahead and try Data Graph uh, completely for free on that trial. And you, we have tutorials available where you can use the tutorial side by side with the free trial and you can try it out completely for yourself. Uh, so please go ahead and check that out. Uh, sign up to check out all of AnyPoint platform as well as Data Graph. Awesome. Um, thanks, Kevin. I So we, I don't know, Bruno, are, are you still here? Um, because he had a question about MuleSoft um, streaming. Okay, cool, he's still here. So basically what I can show off, Bruno, to you, I, it, I didn't really come prepared with this, so uh, just, yeah, don't mind me, but um, I have a little demo up here that I can kind of show off. Um, so kind of what you're talking about is like, uh, I'm not going to be using Apache Kafka for this, um, but I want to let you know that like using MuleSoft and REST APIs, right, you can stream real-time data um, very easily with DataWeave and with AnyPoint platform. Um, so like, let's say you create this REST API and then you want to expose this REST API with GraphQL and you want to make GraphQL queries and be able to stream. Like, I'm pretty sure you can do that using DataGraph uh, because it basically works in the same way. You create the REST API first and then you can basically consume that with GraphQL if you want to. Um, but in this example, right, we set up a path streaming and then we have a, trans uh, a transform message where we're basically going to map some information um, in real time. So what we can do is we can go to the terminal um, and we can basically use the data weave command line uh, to call this local host. Um, so let's go ahead and run this project. Um, and we can go ahead and we can stream some data in real time. So that way you can kind of see how this works. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll create a new window here and I'll run a tail command. So that way we can basically um, listen in on our API endpoint. Um, to listen for things happening in real time. Um, so let's go ahead and do this so I can run a tail. Okay. And then let's go ahead and run this data weave uh, script where basically what we're going to do is we're going to create new data. We're going to create hundreds of thousands of different payloads. Um, so let's go ahead and do that here. So if we run this command, Let's see if it'll work. So you see this, so this is streaming in real time. So what this is doing, so just to, as an explanation, is we're basically writing to a CSV in real time over an API, right? And this is how fast it's basically writing to the CSV. Um, and you can see that this tail command basically will update whenever the CSV is being written to. So this is a great example of how you could basically create an API that is streaming data in real time and then writing to an external system. So let's say you need to write to an external database, right? Um, this is kind of how you would do that. And it's really as simple as when you create your transform message, 
um, you put deferred equal to true in your output headers. And then when you go into your configuration XML um, and you look in your configuration XML, I think there's an option where you set streaming equal to true. And that allows you to stream the information in real time. I'm just looking for that here where that would be. Um, yeah, right here. So when you go to output MIME type, um, you basically define it as application JSON and then you set streaming equal to true. And so that'll allow your API to basically be able to stream data in real time. Um, and that's really how simple it is. So I hope Bruno, that was helpful to you. And uh, yeah, let us know if you have any other questions or if that kind of answers your question, so. Yeah, I can add a question to that. So, so you have a connector, connector as well, well uh, that you can use inside, inside and you can go out. I'm just, just in the link, link, link chat, chat here. here. So you so can you use it in any mission in Studio that you want to show. And with that, you can use Kafka to stream stream and you'll have it. Yeah, I guess, Bruno, what we can show you real quick, if you're still here. Um, so I'm actually in AnyPoint Studio. And so this is how you add the Kafka, Kafka connector. So you just go to, once again, add modules, and then you click this, right? And this will import it into uh, your project, right? I don't have Kafka uh, set up right now, um, but you can see here, um, you can basically publish, you can set up a message listener. So let's say we want to publish a message, right? We can drag and drop this connector into our flow, and then we can set up our connector configurations with Kafka. So let's say we want to stream data to Kafka or we want to stream data from Kafka, right? This is how easy it really would be to do that. So you just set up your server URLs, you test the connection, and then you basically set up your topics, your partitions, your keys, right? And that's kind of how you would do that. So. Cool. All right, well, I think that kind of wraps it up, right? Um, Kevin, we're pretty much at time. I think we have another like three minutes or five minutes. So yeah, but I think, I think we're pretty good here, so. Yeah, thanks all for coming. Uh, uh, have fun being here. And uh, yeah, we'll be from other set of solutions. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, hope you enjoyed this talk. And yeah, if you once again, if you have any other questions or you want to get started about MuleSoft, I'd recommend uh, going to the developer tutorials page on the MuleSoft.com website. Um, so go and check that out. We also have training available. So if you want to take a training class, so that way you can go get up to speed on uh, basically how to you like the fundamentals of any point platform. We do we cover stuff on you know, how to deploy to external clouds, like let's say uh, AWS or Azure, right? There's tons of different training classes and tutorials out there. So just go view those resources. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at MuleDev on Twitter um, or reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, just send us an email to the DevRel email and we'll be more than happy to talk to you and help you with your integration challenges. So um, it looks like Bruno might have one more question. Let's see what he has to say <laughs> before he... Uh, before we head out. So is it possible of hybrid deployment? Yes, it is. So if Kevin, if you want to go into details on that, uh, I'll let you kind of take that away. But yes, it's possible. Sure. Sure. You're trying just on your microphone real fast. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so it is possible to have hybrid deployment. Uh, so your mule runtimes can be in any cloud. So we have, uh, so exactly how, how you said it right there. Um, if you want to put a gateway, we have a managed cloud. It's called Cloud Hub. That's a fully managed cloud service if you want to put it on there. If you want to deploy a gateway onto your own uh, server, onto an AWS instance you have, Azure, Google Cloud, you can do that as well. Um, and you can deploy to a combination of these. So if you did have a microservice and you wanted to put a gateway in front of that, for example, uh, we have, an apply we have an, a, a feature called AnyPoint Runtime Fabric where you can go ahead and spin up a, a cluster in the server or in the location that you want to actually go ahead and deploy your gateway. And then you can deploy your gateways to the runtime fabric and you'll get all the benefits of the control plane still uh, to go ahead and uh, manage that. The high level architecture of that deployment. 
recommend right now is the docks, just like I did uh, for the Kafka connector. I'm going to put the docks for runtime fabric in here. And you can see in the docs uh, what a, deploy a, a production uh, deployment of this would look like, uh, the amount of worker controllers, uh, things of that nature that you would spin up. Uh, to go ahead and do that. And uh, this can be, again, on a managed Kubernetes. It can be on AKS, EKS, or GKE. It can be on your own private cloud, uh, AWS, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, or it can be on your own data center. The high-level architecture. If you just click on one of the, like, on self-managed Kubernetes or on VMs or bare metal in the docs on the left-hand side in the menu, uh, you can see an example of uh, what the runtime fabric looks like. Otherwise, we also have a webinar uh, on, you know, on mule deployment options. Uh, that'll be on webinars at mulesoft.com. Uh, please do check that out, out as well. I think we're pretty good. Oh, Bruno has one more. Okay. I hope they want to. Yeah, I think I think Helm charts and GitHub. Sure, I got those two. Uh, so if you are deploying to a Kubernetes and you want to, uh, you know, manage your Helm charts, even if it's with runtime fabric, uh, we have a CLI utility from which you can see your Helm charts and things of that nature. Uh, that all should be in the docs. Um, for GitHub, we have a GitHub uh, plugin. So a very common use case that customers have where they're managing uh, Mule projects, they use the GitHub plugin to push code to dev branch, QA branch, whatever it is. Um, and you can go ahead and, and use it that way. So Helm chart to open source, I am not sure. Uh, happy to follow up on that uh, if you would like. Uh, when, as Jordan said, if you want to reach out to uh, some of the channels he was speaking about. Uh, otherwise, you know, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn as well. But uh, happy to follow up on that one. Um, well, thank you, Bruno, for the questions. I hope that answered everything for you. And yeah, thanks again so much to everyone who attended the session. Um, yeah, and I think we have to wrap it up here. So. Talk to, talk to everyone soon and uh, have a good one.